Well, good evening. evening. You've got to get a pastor with some enthusiasm here. (laughs) Well, I'm very delighted to be with you tonight to talk about this topic of ethics in an election year. When I talk to my colleagues at school and they ask me what I'm going to talk about, and I say ethics in an election year, they say, isn't that an oxymoron? (laughs) I say, well, I hope not. (laughs) Um, Now, first of all, I am not going to tell you who to vote for. So, but if you want to see me afterwards, I have a few thoughts. (laughs) I, I think my job is to, well, to do what I'm going to do, and that is to try and help create a lens from our tradition, you know, I'm not making this stuff up, from our tradition, through which all of us should look as Catholic Christian people at candidates and at the agendas that the candidates put before us. And, you know, we're not just voting for president and vice president and a new administration in Washington. We're voting for 235 members of the House. I don't remember how many in the Senate, 11 governors across this nation. So, the agenda that we have to look at and the number of people that we have to assess uh, are pretty, you know, can be pretty staggering. Let me begin uh, what I have to say formally with a quotation from a document put out by the American bishops every four years, and it's called Faithful Citizenship, Forming Consciences for whatever, I forget the rest of the title. By the way, I brought a handout that's someplace, and it's a list of resources that you can go to. One of them is to this document, which you can get full text online. It's a really good document written by the American bishops. And then there's a few other resources that you might want to check out. The bishops say this, in the Catholic tradition, responsible citizenship is a virtue. And in our tradition, a virtue is the mean between two extremes. So responsible citizenship is a virtue. It's a way of being excellent citizens, in other words. And participation in political life is a moral obligation. In other words, it's not optional. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to vote. But it does mean that as Catholic Christian people, we have an obligation to engage the issues. We cannot simply say, oh, it's too much. It's too boring. It's too complicated. It's too whatever. Our leadership in our church calls us to this moral obligation. And they tell us that the obligation is rooted in our baptismal commitment to follow Jesus Christ and to bear Christian witness in all we do. So as that is the kind of background, let me say the following. As Catholic Christian people, whose bishops say that we have a moral obligation to participate in the political process, I think we start out at an ethical disadvantage as Americans for this reason. First of all, the failure of campaign finance reform. You can't be an ordinary person in this country and become president. It just won't happen. At some point, the citizens of this nation have to rise up with some moral outrage and say, enough. We have to. You people in Congress, in the presidency, and elsewhere must address campaign finance reform. The second reason we're at a moral disadvantage in my book is the failure of ethics reform in the United States Congress. We have people serving, hopefully serving, who oftentimes are under investigation and under indictment for breaking the law that they are sworn to uphold. And we fail administration after administration to reform the ethical agenda of the people who are in service uh, to all of us in this country. Now, those two things are important. The next two are equally important, but I think they're a little bit more of a conundrum for us. The third 
ethical disadvantage that we face as voters is the influence of the media on the American political agenda and on our ability to know and understand the issues. Now, I'm, I'm not much of a commentator on the media, but I do know this. If you watch the major st networks, you will not get a, an in-depth analysis of the issues. You get what the owners of the networks want us to get. Now, unfortunately, to go to the places where we can get an in-depth analysis of the issues, sometimes they're so in-depth that they're absolutely not understandable. But there are places where we can go. Uh, you know, interestingly, one of the places is the BBC. Another of the places are places like um, PBS. Now, people will say NPR, they're too biased, they're too this, they're too right, they're too left. But I think part of our moral obligation as voters in this democracy is to find a news source that gives us the truth. <laughs> as difficult as the truth is to hear at times. And finally, and I hesitate to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway because I am not that smart. I think we're at an ethical disadvantage at times because of the sometimes unhelpful input from church leaders who say, if you vote for Mr. Smith, that's a sin. Well, that is not our tradition. The only person who knows if you sin is you and, of course, God. The bishops can say the agenda is wrong, the issues are skewed, the this is that and whatever. But at least in my, I think, schooled opinion, the bishop has no right to tell any one of us who to vote for or who not to vote for. That's a matter of individual conscience. Now, do we have to form those consciences in light of the teaching of the church? Absolutely. That's the next piece here. But <clears throat> let me just say, I do think we're at a disadvantage, and I think part of our obligation is to work to overcome those disadvantages by demanding that people in public service clean up their own house, and then searching out adequate, appropriate, and, and truthful sources uh, whereby we can know what the issues are. All right. Even though we're at a disadvantage, we still have a moral obligation to participate in the process. And in the midst of this, what I would call a moral mess, that's a technical term, a moral mess, we have to rely on our informed and formed consciences when we cast our ballots. Because ultimately and fundamentally, voting is a matter of conscience for the person of faith. Now, let me just quickly say this about conscience, because I don't think we think about it very much in our, in our daily lives. In the Catholic tradition, we have three ways of looking at conscience. The first way is that we have this, what, what Thomas Aquinas called, an abiding characteristic to know the good, the true, the right. It's part of us. We're created in God's image, so we have to have some you know, sense of what is good, what is right, because we're of God. We have this abiding characteristic, but we also think of conscience as a process that is continually in motion, that we form on a daily basis, hopefully, that we come to know gradually, more and more fully, what is the true, what is the right, what is the good. And we do that by conversation with those in our community. Certainly we do that by uh, being part of a community such as this one, where you worship, where you learn, where you pray, where you struggle, where you do all the things you do. And we do that by studying the teaching of the church, as difficult as that is to do. You know, I've never read any of the official documents of the church that I would call page turners. <laughs> you know, I'm, I often say to myself, I'm going to wait for the movie, but they never make the movie. <laughs> but, you know, I'm going to dial back to 1968 when Paul VI issued Humanae Vitae, the encyclical on birth control. Now, 
I do a lot of work in healthcare ethics around the country. And I can't tell you the hundreds and hundreds of doctors and nurses and hospital administrators and women and men who use Catholic Health Services that say, I disagree with the teaching on birth control. And I say to them, what is it? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know, but I disagree with it. <laughs> Have you ever read Humane Vitae? What is that? They don't know what it is. Now, I'm not doing this to be funny. That's the truth. You know, many people, good Catholics, making moral decisions every day about everything from the beginning of life to the end of life and everything in the middle, the church has teachings on, on most of that. And most people, in my experience, now maybe you're very different, have not read the documents that convey the teaching of the church. So part of the process of forming our consciences is to try to grapple with that teaching in uh, various and sundry ways. And then finally, conscience is this abiding characteristic where we, we have this intuition about what's right and good. We, we work on a regular basis to form our consciences so we get better at discerning what's the right and the good thing. And then finally, we have to make a judgment. And so on November 4th, I think it's November 4th, you know, we're all going to go to the polls, I hope, and cast our ballot having informed and formed our consciences by at least reading the document that I mentioned at the beginning, Faithful Citizenship, having conversations with other people of goodwill who are trying to understand the very complex issues that the candidates are talking about in sound bites, by the way. Uh, and then we make a judgment and we do the best we can. We make a prudential judgment. That's what judgments of conscience are. All right, so, so far so good? Oh, now, by the way, anytime you want to ask a question or disagree, please feel free to do that because once this train gets out of the station, I just kind of like pick up speed and I keep talking and talking and I never shut up. So, so if you want to say something, please do. All right. In order to call upon then this abiding characteristic, which is ours, to gather information and use it well to make the moral judgment about who am I going to vote for, we really have to create an ethical or a moral lens, if you will, through which we look at the candidates and the proposals they're making about all the issues. To create that moral lens as Catholics, it seems to me, we have to first of all be sure about what a moral issue is and then draw upon the values of our tradition that are very familiar to us but oftentimes we don't utilize. So making sure that we know what is a moral issue. What, what, if I say you have to make a moral decision, what would you say that moral decision, what, what makes it moral as opposed to, you know, you go to the grocery store, you're going to buy peas for dinner or broccoli. That's not a moral decision. Well, unless you're married to George Bush and he doesn't eat broccoli, but anyway. It's not a moral decision whether you're going to have peas or broccoli for dinner. But if I'm going to stop at the red light at the corner when school is being dismissed, that's a moral decision. What makes it so? Consequences. Okay, the consequences, yeah. The effect on others. The effect on others. Very good, you get an A. Moral decisions, ethical decisions, and I use those terms interchangeably, by the way. Moral decisions are about human good. About. What you hear and what they tell us, you're making an assumption that it's true, that, that what you read and what you hear is the truth. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get the connection. Am I making an assumption? I think we all do. Oh, absolutely, sure. You know, because I think. We want, to, we want to believe people, especially people who are going to be our leaders. But we'll get to that in a minute. Let me just finish this point. A moral decision is about what is good for persons in community and what is good for persons beyond our circle of people we know. So any issue that any political raises in this run-up to the elections on November 4th, that
that have to do with human well-being, the good of persons, the good of this earth, the good of the cosmos, because all of that affects human persons, is a moral issue. Now, I can't think of many issues that these candidates of ours, both on the national and the local level, are raising that are not moral issues. I think they're all moral issues because they're about affecting human good and well-being. Now, that ought to lend a little weight to the bishops telling us that we have a moral obligation to be part of this process because what we're doing is trying to effect the well-being of our nation, other nations, and people all around this globe. And if you don't think that the decisions we make in November are connected to people on the other side of this earth, then we need to have another talk later on. Because we live in a global village. And the decisions that are made here are going to have impact around this world. And oftentimes on the poorest and the most vulnerable people on this earth. All right, so that's what makes a moral issue. What values and principles of our tradition, our Catholic tradition, which is now thousands of years old, and much of it is drawn from the Jewish tradition before us, um, should form the lens through which we look at and assess candidates and their proposals. These are not going to be unfamiliar to you. The sacredness of life and the dignity of the human person across the continuum of life. Now, one of the things, you know, we all know that life is sacred. That's, that's been part of our understanding of our faith tradition from the time that we, you know, were born and baptized into the faith. Why is life sacred? Why do we say that life is sacred? We say it is sacred because God creates us in God's own image. Not just you and you and you and you. But people who are not part of our faith tradition, people with whom we have vehement disagreements, Osama bin Laden is created in the image and likeness of God, whether we like it or not. The terrorists who flew into the Twin Towers are created in the image and likeness of the Creator God, whether we like it or not. They didn't act upon that, but still, they are God's creation. And as we think about voting for president, vice president, and whomever, part of, I think, one of the most significant pieces of that moral lens that we bring to assessing their policies, their proposals, is how do they affect the human person and the sacredness of the human person? The dignity of every person. You know, one of the things I, I've worked in healthcare for 40 years, which I find astounding. I must have started when I was eight. <laughs> um, thank you for that. <laughs> um, how often we hear people say, that person has no dignity. Why not? Because they're old and they have dementia, or because they're alcoholic and they're sleeping on the street or because they've always been willing to take a handout and they don't have the gumption to get a job and do it for themselves. They have no dignity. That's not our tradition. Our tradition says every person is sacred and is a being of dignity regardless, regardless of their social location, their political persuasion, their gender, and their behavior. What we often do is to fail to recognize their dignity and act in a way as if they did not have dignity. That says loads about us and very little about them. Because every person created in God's image bears that image within and is a person of an estimable dignity. How do you take that reality of our tradition and cast a light on the proposals that are being made by the candidates around all sorts of issues. Health care, education, care for poor and vulnerable people, you name it. I'm not going to get into the issues. I'm 
you know, I do 40,000 feet, and then I leave, and you have to figure out all the answers. <laughs> all right, so that's the first value and principle. The second one, and this is really one that causes people to get into knots. Our tradition has from the get-go, Jesus being probably the best proponent of this, called us to a commitment to the common good. And that commitment to the common good of all is rooted in our tradition's affirmation that we are created in the image of God and therefore we are social by nature, not by choice. We are created for community and we will thrive only in the context of community and we have rights in the context of community but we have corresponding obligations to every other member of the community. This commitment to the common good is rooted in the fact that the God who creates us in God's image is a community of persons. That's what Trinity means. Now, when we start looking at things like proposals for tax policy, proposals for reforming health care, which needs great reformation, proposals for leaving no child behind in terms of education, in addition to this lens of the sacredness of life and the dignity of all persons, we have to add this dimension of a commitment to the common good. What a commitment to the common good means in the Catholic tradition's perspective, and this is really hard for us as Americans to hear, is that self-interest cannot come first or ought not to come first. Now, you know, as I was driving here today, I, like many of you, was listening to the news. I listen, I'm an addicted to uh, NPR, I have to say. I can mimic every person's voice that starts at 7 o'clock in the morning and ends at 8 o'clock at night. I, I can do them all, especially Sylvia Pujoli. I love her. Anyway, so I was listening to the, cra the, to the collapse of the capital market. It's affecting, may, it may be affecting people in this parish. Some people's total savings have been wiped out, not just with Lehman, but for the past several years with the collapse of Enron and you name it. The, the price of gasoline. You know, I went to the grocery store the other day and I picked up a loaf of bread that's not even, you know, fancy. It cost four dollars and six cents. A loaf of well, it's whole wheat, a loaf of bread. Now, you know, how do people survive today? Self-interest is often how we survive in difficult times. But our tradition calls us to try and rein in self-interest as the driver for making decisions about how we address the issues that we're going to address in November and cause us to rethink the way we go about making those decisions in light of our commitment to the communities of which we are members, to the common good. It calls us to three virtues, this commitment to the common good, to solidarity, compassion, and hospitality. Solidarity is that virtue in the Catholic tradition, which we learn from John Paul II, means that in his words, there is no, quote, other. There is no other. We are all members of the same human family. Now, we happen to live in Missouri. Now, I, you know, I don't, I don't know about your part of Missouri, but I live in, over the river Missouri, and We think there's a lot of others out there. There are people with brown skin who come into our neighborhoods and do the lawns. There are people who are black skinned and come into our neighborhoods to haul off our trash. There are people who don't speak our language. There are people who kind of disappear when the sun goes down because they're illegal immigrants. And many people that I know look at those people as, quote, other. 
this virtue of solidarity in, in uh, service to the principle of the common good says, no, 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 there is no other. Second virtue is compassion. Compassion, we usually think of compassion when we're talking about caring for people who are sick or something. But compassion means not just to suffer with the other, it means to experience with the other person. Now, I just used other, and I said there is no other, so. But with another. Compassion means to try and understand the experience of those people that are not like us, and to think about those people as we go to the polls. You know, one of the realities, I, as I've said, I've worked in healthcare for a long time, and I worked at the Catholic Health Association on healthcare reform uh, during the Clinton administration. One of the things that I realized, and many people realized, during that reform effort was that if everybody is going to get basic care, some of us are not going to get what we want. The experience of those who cannot even get basic care is probably beyond our reality. But this principle of the common good and the virtue of compassion call us to try and understand before we go to the polls and cast our ballots for those people who are going to be looking at questions of things like reforming the American healthcare system. What is the experience of people that are not like me? And how does that help me understand how I should cast my ballot? And then finally, hospitality. And this goes directly to the question of immigration. The American bishops have written a wonderful document, and I can't recall the name of it right now, but it's something like uh, Friends Among Us. And it, it develops this notion that there is no other. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ, whether we're Catholic, Christian, Muslim, whatever. So the second piece of the lens, first is sacredness of life and the dignity of persons. The second is the commitment to the common good. Realizing that everything we have, we have because we're members of various communities. And because we have gained so much, we have an obligation to make sure that others have what they need as well. The third piece of this lens is something that we hear very infrequently because it strikes at the heart of, I think, a free market capitalistic society. And that is, our church calls us to a preferential option for poor and vulnerable people. That's certainly a centerpiece of Catholic social teaching, but we don't hear it much in our culture because it's very, I think, uh, threatening to us. The preferential option for poor and vulnerable people was first articulated uh, in the developing world by the bishops of uh, Latin and South America. When they said that, um, you know, the first world has to pay attention to those who are the least well off because it's not just that we don't have nice cars and nice homes and it's that we don't even have the basic things we need to subsist. And people are dying day in and day out. And that's still the case. We live in a world where we are, you know, nobody wants to hear this, the biggest consumers, the biggest outputters of waste products. And that consumption and that output of waste products has devastating effects on the developing world, whether we like it or not. So a preferential option for poor and vulnerable people. And who's our model for that? Jesus. <laughs> you know, he aligned himself not just with the economically poor. You know, women in Jesus' day were, uh, you know, the, the man had his, his tent, his cattle, his children, and his wife. And he could dispose of all of them, and probably in that order of priority. Jesus aligned himself with women. He aligned himself with lepers. He aligned himself with tax collectors, for heaven's sakes, who were the most repugnant people in town. Well, you know, maybe it's not tax collectors and, and uh, women and lepers today, but there are people that we need to align ourselves with if we are to be true to our traditions, call, 
and that we need to think about how we cast our ballots in a way that prefers their good and well-being. The fourth piece of the lens, if you're not depressed already, is that we have both human rights, as John the 23rd told us in Pachamanteras, but as I said before, we have corresponding obligations. And we have rights, you know, if you read Pachamanteras, uh, Peace on Earth, John 23rd enumerates this enormous list of human rights that starts with things like access to basic health care, the right to emigrate and to migrate, the right to marry, the right to education, the right to a family, the right to work, the right to a decent wage, and, and he goes on and on and on. And because we have these rights, we have obligations to ensure that every other person has access to those same rights. How do we take that to the polls in November? A fifth piece of this lens that is very much a part of our Catholic tradition has to do with the dignity of work and the rights of workers. We are still grappling in places around this nation with this notion of a living wage. A living wage in the Catholic tradition's understanding is um, expressed by um, Paul VI and others after, well, Leo XIII in 1891, but many popes after him. A living wage is a wage that a family, a family, can get by on and live a life that is reasonably fulfilling. A living wage allows a family to live a life that is reasonably fulfilling. Now, I don't know about you, but my life is a heck of a lot more than reasonably fulfilling. You know, I've got a computer in my room, I've got a com at home, I've got a computer in my office, I drive a nice little Prius, I don't have any wants. Everything that I need is provided by my community, and I would suspect that everything that many of you need is provided because you've got adequate jobs, you've got you know, insurance coverage, you've got uh, pension benefits, you, you, whatever. Well, that ain't the case for many, many, many people, not just in our world, but in our state. You know, I live in St. Louis and I have frequent uh, opportunities to drive uh, down around uh, Del Mar, you know, where St. Louis University is, and you drive, if you drive north, uh, toward North City, you see burnt out houses, you see adult males sitting on the stoops of their houses because there is no work for them to have. And you see the effects of that all over that part of our city. So the right to work, what are our candidates saying about the devastation in the job market that's occurring as we sit here even tonight? You know? How many thousands of Lehman workers were just told, go home, yesterday? And how many thousands of Merrill Lynch workers are going to be told, go home, when the Bank of America takes over Merrill Lynch? And finally, you're going to say, phew. Finally, another piece of the lens that we have to put together to look at candidates and proposals uh, is this call that our tradition has been very strong on from the beginning, and that is that we must be stewards of this creation, not just of the human piece of this creation. If you do any reading in ecology, you will know that all of life is intricately bound up together. And every time we destroy a piece of our ecosystem, be that a bacteria, a polar bear, uh, uh, the coral reef, it impacts all of us, all of us who share this, this creation. So, okay, I'm gonna just pause, because I have more, <laughs> but I'm gonna pause. I think these are the at least six pieces that go into putting this lens together, and these come right out of our, of our Catholic teaching. Sacredness of life, commitment to the common good, option for poor and vulnerable people, human rights and responsibilities, the dignity of work and the rights of workers, and the right to work, and then the stewardship of creation. So let me just see if you have any reactions or before I move on.
Yes, sir. A living wage to being one person in the family should be able to support that family. Well, you ready for that question? Should one person, in, by living wage, does it mean one person in the family ought to be able to support the whole family? Certainly, when this notion of living wage was raised by Leo XIII in 1891, that's exactly what he said. And what he said was that the father in the family should be able to support the family. Now, you know, we've come a long way since 1891. Um, but, and, and we know that sometimes parents or couples in a family uh, work one and two jobs to support a family. But I think one of the things that, that we've never clarified is what it means to have a reasonably fulfilling life. You know, does a reasonable, reasonably fulfilling life mean having a home of your own, which is more and more difficult today, being able to send your children to school, um, you know, to public school or to Catholic school? Well, I know places where families who have both parents working sometimes two jobs can't afford to send their kids to Catholic school. Uh, does it mean that we have um, a car and a TV, you know, plasma in every room? Or does it mean uh, something else? So this isn't, none of these things are, are easy concepts to grasp. But a living wage is basically a, a, a wage that a family can live on in a reasonably fulfilling way. Now, unfortunately, in our country, we seem to, to, to stake the living wage at poverty. What equals poverty? And anything above that is a living wage. Well, you know, in some parts of our nation, a family of four are, are not in poverty if they make over $30,000 a year. In some places in our nation, they're deep in poverty if they make $30,000 a year. So it's not an easy uh, thing to translate. Sir. Thank you for bringing up so many uh, interesting issues. I'm not finished. In my opinion, <laughs> I think that you have raised more questions than answers. Uh, yeah, that's that's my job. Eight. <laughs> uh, eight? I'm a father of twenty. Wow. And uh, you mentioned about being uh, uh, created in the image and likeness of God. So uh, that means that. Being created, I'm giving the life like Christ. So, if I am created in the image and likeness of Christ, then uh, I receive life at that time. And when does that life begin? And when does that life have rights? And when does it go into uh, uh, quality of life? Okay. That's how important in that and certain priorities in my voting. That's a great question. In the Catholic tradition, you're not going to believe what I'm going to say, but the church has never said definitively, life begins at this point. Why not? Because we cannot empirically know when life begins. We assume says the church, that life begins at conception. Because there's no empirical way to know when human life begins. But you've got a sperm with 13, uh, 23 chromosomes and an ovum with 23 chromosomes, and they come together, and you have 46 new chromosomes. Well, it's human. It can't be a, you know, can't be a turnip or a dog. It's human, and it's cellular divisions going on. So that's human life. So at conception, um, through natural death, now, let me, let me use your question, and I'm not going to answer it all, to move on a little bit with regard to expanding what I call the life agenda. Because everybody knows that, well, most people know that, no, let me erase that. Most people assume that Catholics are single-issue voters. Are single-issue voters. Have you ever heard that? What does that mean? Everything stands and falls on abortion. Well, I, I want to try to broaden that a little bit. Abortion is a critically important issue. But it's not the only issue. So 
I want to, the, the rest of what I'm going to say is let's broaden the life agenda as we think about casting our ballot in light of this moral lens that we create for ourselves using the values of our tradition. Abortion has many causes. Among them are poverty, lack of education, single parent homes, uh, poor sex education or absent sex education. If we're going to the polls and saying, I will vote for so-and-so and I won't vote for so-and-so, simply on the abortion issue and we do not attend to the issues that cause abortion to be so prominent in our society, we're kidding ourselves that we're voting pro-life. We are not. If we have a candidate, and I, I don't know this, but if we have a candidate that says, I am absolutely opposed to abortion and I'm going to cut Medicaid totally. If we don't know that we are contributing to abortions in this country by denying people of adequate prenatal care, we're fooling ourselves. Medicaid is an abortion issue. And cutting funding for Medicaid often leads poor women to seek abortion because they can't get adequate prenatal care. The availability of legitimate family planning services. You know, there's a lot of, I, I, I did a consultation with a clinic in a rural uh, area in, in the Midwest not so very long ago, where the nurses in the clinic, Catholic Hospital that sponsored the clinic, the nurses in the clinic asked me to come and talk with them because they wanted to give birth control pills to 11, 12, and 13-year-old girls who were on their second, third, and fourth abortions. They didn't want to give them birth control pills to get them hooked on birth control pills. They wanted to give them birth control pills to get them hooked on coming to the clinic so they could educate them about when you go to bed with a boy and you have sex, you're likely to have a baby. This was a very poor rural community where 11, 12, and 13-year-old girls were on their second, third, and fourth abortions. And the nurses cried when they told me that story. So abortion is a very complex, multivalent issue that we ought not simply say he or she is pro or against. But we have to examine the, the relevant policy issues that relate to abortions or, you know, teachings that can move us away from abortions. I'm sorry. But, yes, sir. Uh, um, you might have misunderstood my question. My question primarily was right to life, not concerning abortion or birth control or whatever. Or, uh, my question was as to how... Uh, but to help decide on who to vote for on the right to life. Right. Life as given by Christ at the time of creation, regardless of what time it is. So that's what I want to know. How do I, uh, I understand that 50% probably of Catholics are going to agree that under certain circumstances and so forth, that abortion is okay. I'm not questioning what about abortion. I'm talking about the victim and uh, not being able to have the life that Christ wants him to, right. her to have. That's the question that I have, and I think that's the first uh, highest priority is the right to life. But otherwise, none of the rest of them, uh, social issues and all that, have no meaning to me. Well, I, I think what I'm saying is that these are right to life issues whether there is adequate Medicaid funding, whether there is availability of sex education in our schools that's adequate, that, that, is, that, that really teaches young people what human sexuality, sexuality is and is about, you know, and how you, I hate to say, use it appropriately only in the context of marriage. Um, poverty is a right to life issue in our society. And if you don't believe that, well, then I think, you know, we have to have another conversation. It's a quality of life issue, that's correct. It's, okay, can I just finish? And then we'll go back and we can duke it out later, okay? Um, 
you know, what are the candidates' stances on poverty, the reasons for poverty, the way we resolve questions of poverty? You know, poverty and its consequences are very much at the heart of the high crime rate that we've got in our society, uh, the fact that we have so many thousands and thousands, really millions of Americans, mostly people of color, incarcerated in our society, that we still in some states in our nation use the death penalty as a way to deal with the consequences often of poverty. The U.S. tax policy is a matter of, in many ways, a right to life issue because as we know, uh, many people are terribly adversely affected by the tax status as we, the tax code as we know it now. Questions of immig immigration, the conditions of labor here and abroad are all questions about life issues relative to poverty. You know, there are, we worry about the sweatshops across the border. There are places in these United States where the conditions of the workers are deplorable. Deplorable. And, you know, that ought not to be. Yes, ma'am. Well, you don't know if it's a sin. Well, you can say it's objectively evil, but you cannot say it's a sin. That's simply not consistent with our tradition. Well, because the only person that knows if it's a sin is the person who's doing the action. I mean, we won't get into that conversation. I'm not disagreeing that abortion is a moral evil. I'm not disagreeing with that at all. But what I am saying is that there is more to pro-life agendas than simply abortion. So you've got a candidate who says, I will, and, and I don't want to get into candidates, so just make believe I'm talking about a fictional candidate. I will, I will overturn Roe v. Wade. I will appoint only judges to the Supreme Court who will, subs, you know, who, who will keep any kind of advancement of Roe v. Wade ever from coming back. And by the way, I will prosecute a war preemptively when I so choose. Now, those are both life issues. It's as morally evil to kill living human life as it is to kill unborn life. Presu especially when you have no obvious justifiable reason for killing human life. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not debating the reality that abortion is a moral evil. All I'm saying is if we vote singly on the, a candidate or a set of candidates or an agenda simply for the, the one issue of abortion, we're missing the boat on pro-life. Right. There are other ways to, there, I mean, things that affect abortion are not just legal issues. Right. It's how do we provide a world where that's even less desirable and less an option? So I, I hear you agreeing, you don't want abortion. We gotta fight to end it. I also hear you saying, we've gotta fight all those battles. How to end, how to make sure that every person is known and cherished as a child of God. Absolutely. And I, I guess the, you know, one of the points that I really want to make is that 
because a particular candidate is anti-abortion does not necessarily mean that they are pro-life across the continuum. So if you've got a candidate who says absolutely no abortion, it's a terribly, terribly, terrible thing to do, but I'm going to slash and burn the Medicaid budget. <laughs> you've got a dilemma. You've got a real dilemma. Now, I don't know that any candidate's saying that. But what I'm just trying to do is to say abortion is important, but it is not the only pro-life issue. There are many others. And you don't agree with that, and that's fine. I'm sorry? Yep. Uh, father in the back. I think it's father in the back. All I can see is your head. Could you stand up so I can hear you? Thank you. Well, yeah, let's not, hyperbole is great, but. So, uh, he said, what's the letter? It was from 1988, the, um, it's a letter, I don't know. It's a letter, I can look that up later. I got it on my phone, I have to look for it. He says, the inviolability of the person, which is a reflection of the absolute inviolability of God, finds its primary and fundamental expression in the inviolability of, human, inviolability of human life. Above all, the common outcry, which is justly made on behalf of human rights, for example, the right to health, to home, to work, to family, to culture, is false and illusory if the right to life, the most basic and fundamental right, and the condition for all other personal rights is not defended maximum determination. So, yeah. Good. Very good. That's great. I agree. What's yeah, the deal? I, I think that there's <laughs> issues. There's a lot of issues, and it's not just like an issue of whether or not abortion is... It's abortion, like what you're trying to say is that abortion is not this, this thing out there. I'm sa trying to say it's not the only issue that is a life issue. Exactly. However, it seems to me that the church... John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and on back, or I should say Benedict, John Paul, and on back. And the whole teaching of the church is that, fundamentally speaking, the right to life is like the highest uh, truth there, or the highest good is the right to life in the Correct. Yeah. So, I. I don't there disagree with that. To fix other things, but if we don't fight tooth and nail for the right to life in the first place, well, anyway. yeah, I, I don't disagree with that at all. I, I, I guess I'm not going to make this point, or you're not going to get the point I'm trying to make, and that is the issue of the right to life is intimately linked with many other social issues that candidates have agendas about. And sometimes candidates can be adamantly pro-life and anti-life at the same time. And if you don't examine their platforms and their issues and their approaches, simply saying, I vote for the candidate who says no abortions. Well, you might be voting for the wrong candidate. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a college student and a high school student, and you, I've heard you say things that would help me broaden my perspective from an, on ethics with respect to an election and all these social issues and things that our faith holds important. I know that I can't watch any news television channel or even radio and feel that it's unbiased or that my struggle is where are the facts? <laughs> it, and I believe you have the education and the information
confusion that would help someone like myself or other people in this room, because I don't feel confident when I watch the evening news or watch CNN or there's always a spin on it. And it's very hard to get to the point where you can make a judgment in your own conscience. And so do you have some guidelines to, to take the discussion away from, I, I hear and agree with what you're saying, but how can you help me find a place where I can get yeah. the information that the church holds relevant and that I can make my own informed conscience decision? Great question. One place to go, and, and I, said I brought a handout. Uh, on that handout is the website for the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops. And on that website is the thing on faithful citizenship. But it's also any document around any issue uh, that you have an interest in, from abortion to end of life decision making to everything in between. That's, one, that's the place to go, I think, for the Catholic perspective. And the Bishops Conference in, in Missouri. Uh, is a separate website. I'm not sure I have that listed, but you just put uh, Catholic Conference of Missouri in a web browser and it'll take you to the conference. And they have positions on various issues. Um, but a, a non-religious uh, place to go, I think, that's very helpful is the Pew Charitable Trust, which is a non-allied, uh, politically allied organization that really tries to bring the issues to the fore and analyze them from a, from a unbiased perspective. That's one uh, place to go. The other is the Kaiser Family Foundation, which has a whole section of their web, whatever you call it, on, uh, it says on the right-hand corner when you get on their webpage, you just put in Kaiser Family Foundation, it says election 08. And it brings up the candidates' positions on various and sundry issues. And doesn't, it doesn't judge them, it just puts them side by side and lets you see the differences. Yeah, well, I'm not sure that we all make those kind of assumptions. I think that we're smarter than that. I think that many people in this room. They don't assume that, the, that what the candidates say. I don't. They're going to do. <laughs> no. Then why, why are we having this discussion? Because we're all going to go back and listen very carefully to farm our conscience while we're assuming that what we're hearing and seeing and reading is mostly the truth. And I got news for you. Yeah, well, I'm sorry you're so angry. Um, well, I'm not angry. Oh, I'm, not angry I'm glad. Okay, that's good. I'm uh, confused. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think this is a very difficult thing to do, is to form our consciences and try to vote for the right person when we don't hear the truth, when we hear a lot of rhetoric, when, when all of the issues that we are exposed to are in sound bites, where the candidate says this when he's on the West Coast and that when he's on the East Coast. Uh, the candidate says this when she's in front of blue collar workers and something else when she's talking to Wall Street people. Um, you know, this is a very fallible thing that we're involved in. But we have to make the best of it because we have a moral obligation to try and help shape our reality according to the values of our tradition and the gospel. And that's a very tall task. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Well, let me just do a quick little thing in moral theology. There is an objective order of morality where every killing of innocent human life is always and everywhere morally evil. However, there is also a subjective level of reality. And for me to commit the sin of murder, I have to engage my will and be fully free and know that I am doing something morally evil. And only if those three things are part of the equation can I say I sinned. You cannot say that about me. You can say she's done something morally evil. She broke the <coughs> fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Whether it's a sin is between me and God. And that's, I'm not making this up. This is part of our tradition from the get-go. Thomas Aquinas says that in the Summa. Now, that's not, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to uh, 
say that people that are doing bad things are not doing bad things. And I don't want to, I don't want to vote for somebody who's a bad person who does bad things. But whether or not they're sinning is, is not for me to judge. Yes? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I think you had said at the beginning, and just to clarify, I think you had said something to the effect of just because it's a moral, uh, an objectively evil act doesn't mean that I've done a sin. Correct. Right? And yes. I, and she was trying, I think you were trying to say that someone can tell us that you've committed sin. That doesn't mean that we have. That's correct. I mean, sure. regardless of the fact, it's still an evil. And an evil oh, yeah. Done. Absolutely. And so I think the point is, is that we have to inform ourselves, we have to inform our culture that certain things are evil intrinsically, objectively, completely evil. And I think, I think that was the whole point of what you had said before, that somebody can tell you, and we can scream from the rooftops that you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. But... We have to show people that the things that are being done in our society are wrong. I mean, they may not. Yeah, and and they're objectively they're objectively wrong because they are harmful to human life. Because they're completely against the nature of the human nature. Right. What are some good ways that we could all, not only ourselves, become more pro-life across the board? How do we help? find and form candidates who will, who will be against abortion and who will help create a world that does not have such poverty, racism, war, and just like I, 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 So how do we do that? How do we, how do we make ourselves more like Jesus across the board? And how do we help get and form candidates who would be like that on a whole broad spectrum? I'm going to leave the first question up to you because you're the pastor. I'll, t I'll try the second. I think one of the ways that we have to work toward getting people into the political process who are good, virtuous, self selfless people is to do what I said needs to be done in the beginning. Reform campaign finance. Make it possible for people, ordinary people, to enter the process. People who come with values, who are not driven. Now, I'm not suggesting that either of the major candidates are driven by their egos, but there does seem to be a little bit of ego there. Plus, they've got, you know, Barack Obama raised $20 million last week. In one week. That it's going to be spent denigrating John McCain. That makes absolutely no sense. So, change the campaign finance laws. I don't know, you know, we pray. We pray in our parishes for vocations to the priesthood and religious life. Why don't we pray for people who are called to the political life as a vocation? I never thought of that till right this minute. That's a good idea. We ought to pray, we ought to encourage people who we know have, you know, the gifts and talents to be civic leaders, to go into it, in, into, into politics. But, you know, the problem is, I think a lot of good people go into politics and get beat up if they want to continue to be good and get perverted if they, if they don't. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. That's my model for the legislator that I'd vote for. Idealistic, values-based, Christian person who only wanted the good of other people, not his own agenda. Well, you know, if we can find those people, how do we find them? I think we nurture them. I think we nurture them, you know? You, f you find a child who's selfless in your family. Maybe you want to say, do you want to be a priest? Do you want to be a religious? Why don't you say, do you want to be the president of the United States or the governor of Missouri? I think it's real hard. We've got such a broken system that it's going to take some kind of cataclysmic event to... Uh, you know, rearrange the deck chairs. I don't know. Somebody had a thought back there. Yes, sir. Father. Yeah. You know, I don't know who said that, that adage that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. So one of the issues is even if we do get um, possibility for normal, average, everyday people that don't have millions of dollars in the bank and people with pockets to keep in the ocean, uh, get into positions of power such as the Senate or, you know, as high as the, the presidency, I mean, you know, does 
simple fact is that we're all sinners and that we're all, we all fall prey to sin. And when people are given that kind of power and that kind of control, it's very easy to fall prey to sin. So I think, like, I mean, I know that, you know, the secular world's like, yeah, whatever, but the ultimate answer is that if we, if we don't have conversion in our own heart each and every day, like, well, forget about it because, you know, we're never going to have a perfect leader in this world. Oh, absolutely. But we could do better. <laughs> now, there's a really good book written by Marianne Glendon, who is a Harvard law professor, and she was one of the Pariti at the Second Vatican Council, one of the only women there. And she is, I believe now, the ambassador of the United States to the Vatican. She's an attorney. And she wrote this book called Rights Talk, probably 20 years ago. And one of the premises of the book is one of the reasons that our political system is so difficult is that the founding fathers, most of them were attorneys. They were lawyers. And, and most of the people who have come after them in the power structure of our nation have been attorneys. I mean, if you look at the Congress of the United States, by and large, we're dealing with lawyers. And what is law, how, how does law work in the American understanding of it? It's an adversarial relationship. And, you know, is that the best way to, to rule a nation that, that is the most powerful on earth by this kind of adversarial, you know, beating each other over the heads and whatever. But I have one final thing to say before I get tarred and feathered and sent home. Uh, and that is, and it, it goes back to this notion of, you know, there's more to the pro-life agenda than simply abortion. And this is what I want to end with. Bringing our commitments of faith to the political forum, to dialogue in the political forum. One of the things that I've been concerned about for a long time and remain concerned about is that when Catholic people oftentimes go to the public forum to have the debate around the issues, people simply close their ears to us because they only hear one thing. There's four ways that we can bring our faith to the conversation in the public square. One is by ethical imperialism. We have the truth. Nobody else has it. End of conversation. Well, that makes our voices oftentimes mute. The second way to do this is by accommodationism, which is what Geraldine Ferraro did. I don't believe in abortion, but you know, I'll, I'll kind of go with the flow. Well, no. <laughs> we can't be that way either. The third is sectarianism. That is, we carve out our little piece of the world and we move away and we go and circle our wagons at the top of the hill and we don't talk to anybody. And if the wrong people are elected, we say, well, that's your fault. The way we ought to be engaged in the political conversation, and we should be there because of the values of our tradition, is through persuasive dialogue. Persuasive dialogue. Helping people understand what what grounds our tradition's commitment to life from conception through natural death, but also what our tradition has to say about all the other life issues that relate to things like abortion and at the other end of life, physician-assisted suicide. You know, when Oregon passed the assisted suicide bill in whatever it was, 1987 or something, or 92 or whatever, the primary reason that they did that was because people were getting inadequate pain relief as death approached. And there were a number of Catholics in the broader community who were arguing that adequate pain relief is tantamount to euthanasia. Well, they didn't know our tradition. That's, you know, our tradition says people should be relieved of pain as death approaches even if that means death is hastened. The bishops of the United States wrote that. Catholic people don't know it. So, persuasive dialogue, listening, hearing, and then putting our position forward in a manner that people can engage it, but not shutting the door and saying, you know, we're right and everybody else is wrong. Now, I want to end on a happy note because I see some people looking at me. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I think you're saying we should try to create a society where women don't feel the need for a 
abortion. Absolutely. And we're doing that with Pregnancy Resource Center, and any group that helps pregnant uh, women. We're, we're doing a small part there. Yeah. You know, I, I have a friend who's a moral theologian, who's a very prominent moral theologian, I won't mention his name, but when Roe v. Wade was being debated in the United States, uh, in the Congress, um, he said, if Catholic hospitals across this nation said to pregnant women all over who did not want that pregnancy, if Catholic hospitals said, come to us, we'll take care of you, through your pregnancy, we'll deliver the baby and we'll place the baby in an adoptive home, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today with regard to abortion. And I believe that's true. And I think, I think what you just said is absolutely the key. And, and that's why I said that there are other life-related issues that feed into the abortion question that have to do with policies, you know, the, the dearth of, of prenatal services that are available, to many women, particularly poor women in our society, the lack of adequate sex education in our schools, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Can you just talk a little louder? I'm sorry. Just have the conversation with people, though. I mean, that's all I'm saying is, you know, we need to be in the conversation. All right. Total change of subject, and this has nothing to do with Sarah Palin. I'm going to tell you a parable. It's about two moose hunters. <laughs> Honestly, it's not about Sarah Palin. These two moose hunters love to go out in the wilderness every year and go moose hunting. And so, they hire a pilot to take them up to this little lake and they go off into the wilderness to hunt. So they hired this pilot. And he takes them and he gets them into his little plane with pontoons so it can land on the water and he has all their equipment and these two big moose hunters and he takes them up to the northern country and comes up to the dock and lets them out and he says, I will be back at the same time one week from now. I'll pick you up here and take you home, but you can only bring back one moose. They said, why? Because look at the size of the plane. The motor isn't big enough to get the two of you, your equipment, and two moose off the lake. I can do it with one moose. They say, all right, all right. So they go off. One week later, pilot comes back, taxis up to the dock. There they are. Two moose hunters, all their equipment, and two moose. Pilot is furious by the time he gets there. Says to them, I told you, you can only bring one moose. I can't take two. They say, now come on, come on. You, you know, you can, we can make room, we can make this work. He says, I don't have enough power in this little plane. They said, we do this every year. We'll pay you really well if you take us back and we'll give you a contract for the next 10 years. Well, of course, he gives in to this bribe and so he stuffs the two moose in the back of the plane, all their equipment, the two moose hunters, he gets in the plane. He takes it way down to the end of the lake and he revs up the engine and he puts it in whatever you put it in to make the plane move. And as it goes down the lake, he pulls back on the stick and the engine is straining and straining and he's praying and he pulls back on the stick and sure enough, it comes off the water, but not enough to make it past the trees. So he hits the trees, the plane falls to the earth, the two moose fall out, the two moose hunters fall out, all their equipment falls out, and the pilot falls out. 
Only dead people, uh, the only dead creatures were the moose. They all survived. And as they're waking up, one pilot says to the other, where are we? And the other pilot says, about 100 yards further than last year. <laughs> okay, well thank you for your attention. <laughs>